Hello, Ian. You can unmute yourself. You are up first, sir. Hello. Hi, Bart. How's it going, Ian? Pretty well, pretty well. How's everything on your end? Good. So you got a hand for us coming out of where? This is in South Florida, Seminole uh, Coconut Creek. Ah, Co Coconut Creek. I don't know if I've ever played there or what, uh, but like I've heard the games are pretty 30 good. 30 minutes away from the Hollywood Hard Rock. Right, right. Coconut Creek, kind of one of the smaller, kind of a smaller room, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And what's what's the uh, game level you're playing out? Uh, I'm playing 2-5. Okay, so 2-5. Max buy-in is 1,000. All right. So 1,000 uh, max buy-in, 2-5. And how deep are you for this hand? Effective stack is 700. Okay. Good. Good use of the term effective stack, Ian. A lot of people don't know that term. Effective stack, of course, means usually the smallest stack that's relevant to the hand. Um, people are like, uh, I have 2,000, 2,000 effective. My opponent has 500. Well, the effective stack's 500. All right, 700 effective. Okay. So my image, I have a loose aggressive image. Um, I've been opening quite a bit. So I, I guess like my lifting range is kind of capped, especially from the button. I'm the button in this hand. Okay. Okay, so the action is we have three limps. Okay. And it gets to me on the button, and I over limp with six, six, four of clubs. Okay. Big blind. When it gets to the big blind, he raises to 35. Okay. Under the gun, low jack, high jack, and, and myself call. So, Ian, I know you're a CLP subscriber because I read your email uh, in the CLP bucket list. Do you, did you listen to the podcast? that came out this week by chance, the CLP I, podcast? I did not. Okay, so the reason why I bring that up is, is that, so well, a couple things here pre-flop. I had a hand in a podcast that was similar to this. I didn't over limp it, but I did call a raise. Like I over called the raise, like instead of like your setup where it went limp, 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 over limp, it went like raise, call, call, call. And I called on the button with seven, eight suited. And then the guy in the big blind raised like as a three bet, right? Here, he's raising straight. And everybody Cinderella. called and everybody called just like you in this situation here, right? And the thing that I sort of stated in the podcast is like people can look at that like as a double flat and you use the word sort of capped, which you're actually using correct in this sense, like because you over limped, right? You don't have aces, king, you know, you're not going to have a pair above eights, right? And probably like ace, king and ace, queen. Absolutely. That's true. So... I actually double flatted with seven, eight of spades. But the thing was, was that you're getting such a price and you're closing the action on the button. If you were going to ever call in the big blind closing the action, how can you not call in this spot closing the action? So on paper, people might say, oh, this is sloppy. Like, you know, first of all, people might say, oh, don't overlimp this hand. We won't get into that. Six, four suit is probably pretty close. But once you call... Like once you put in the the first limp, I don't see how you could possibly fold closing the action preflop. Um, you know, in the end. Now in Crush Light Poker, of course, we sort of teach a kind of a simplified approach to preflop in these multi-way spots where I say that like once a few people limp in, I'm really only ISO raising my range that I would normally just straight open from from the first few positions. And then everything else playable, you can overlimp small pairs suited connectors, things like that. Sure, someone could say that there are reverse implied odds with this hand. It's a gapped suited connector and it's a little bit low on the high card value. I don't think it's terrible just saying that, but I will say I can't see how you could possibly limp and then fold. So I have no problem with you obviously continuing once the guy you know raises. So it looks like it's what, one, what, four, one, two, five ways, including the, the guy? Yeah, I, I have like 175. Yeah. Okay, so 175, you overlimp with 6-4 club, guy in the big blind raises, everybody calls. Okay, yep. And uh, my question is, uh, is this just a fold preflop? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, it really depends on the rake and the drop structure, I think, and the, and the sort of uh, the stack depth. If you were playing to one extreme... If you were playing in a very sort of like, say the 2-3 game in California with like a 300 max buy-in, where they're going to drop the full amount no matter what, I think you probably should fold. If it was a, okay. a drop is one where they take the entire amount, right? Now, in between is a rake where they take a percentage up to an amount and then you have time, right? Like in Texas, I think Florida's a rake. Is that right? Up to a certain amount? Yeah. So in this casino, it's a $6 rake. Um, max and uh, two dollars for the jackpot, so eight dollars total. So is it a percentage up to six? Yeah, percentage. Yeah, I think up to like fifty dollars. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, 
depending on where how deep the stacks are, you could absolutely make a case for folding. I kind of think like the deeper you are and the weaker the players, the more it becomes a, a playable hand. But if you are very in a very sort of very small stakes live game with very small stacks and a high rake structure, yes, I would fold. But I, I think it's close. Like I've been experimenting with like limping and because like there was like a lot of weak players in hand and I have a habit of just like kind of like trying to steal pots like, you know, when the, when the, with a bad run out for the preflop razor. Right, right. And, you, you know, obviously it becomes harder to do that, though, when it's more multi-way, right? That's, that's true. That's true. And I, I didn't think I, th I didn't think about that. <laughs> so we're 175 to the flop. Okay, what's the flop? The flop is six of spades, okay. six of diamonds, and the two of clubs. Six of spades, six of diamonds, two of clubs. So you flop trips. Yes. Okay. It, it went check, check, check. Hijack uh, bets 55. Okay. So a little, uh, under third. Uh-huh. Third pot. And then I thought a little bit, but I didn't want to think too long. And I just, I just make click to 125. I usually, I never, I usually never make click. I, I don't know why, but my gut just told me to make click here. It's like the best way to get like more money in the pot. <laughs> yeah, this is interesting. I thought that you were going to say that you were going to call. I could actually see, I'm not a huge fan of slow playing all that much like at these levels, like in these games. It's a little bit different though. I will say that it's a little bit different though when the preflop raiser is not the person that you're gonna raise against here. Like here it gets checked all the way over to the guy in the hijack. Sometimes, here's a reason for calling. Sometimes that guy who's the preflop raiser might check an overpair. It happens probably, it's much less common at the lower stakes in a given situation. It just kind of sucks like if you raise and then somebody folds out like tens or jacks, it was kind of playing it sort of safe. Now, with that being said, if the pre-flop raiser was the one that C-bet, I would be doing more raising than, than calling most likely, even on a dry board, even though it's tough to balance because sort of counterintuitively, you're playing the hand more deceptively than by slow playing. Here, I would probably do a lot of calling. I don't think a raise is absolutely terrible. And to be honest with you, a min raise, you could be like trying to find out where you are with like yeah, exactly. fours or something <laughs> like that. So yeah, because I, I would do that with like a, like, you know, eights or nines trying to see where I'm at. But usually I never use them in click. So I don't, I don't even know why I did them in click here. So you go to 125 and what happens? Big blind calls. Okay. So what do you think the big blind has then when he check and then calls a raise? So when he calls, I put him on like aces or kings that doesn't need much protection. Like uh, I feel like, or maybe queens, he could have been like, he was looking for like, like probably looking to check raise. But when I min click, he just flats now. Well, I think we, we can definitely, we definitely know he probably has an overpair, right? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. so that's pretty much what I, I range him to. Mm -hmm. So he, I think his plan was probably the check raise on this board. If someone bets, but I don't know if he was going to check raise, but he was sort of playing it cautiously. So you go to 125, big blind flat calls, and then what happens? Well, he calls up 125 and um, hijack calls as well. All right. So the hijack was a better call. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, big blind he seems like a competent, competent player. I've seen him overflow, overfold to like aggression. Mm -hmm. So the big blind, big blind started this hand with 700, right? And how much did the hijack? No, no, big blind's a thousand. Hijack is 700. Okay. All right. So that makes a difference, obviously. So the hijack has got 700. They both call, and it looks like we're at 550 to the turn. So what's the turn? The turn is the 10 of spades. Okay, that's a pretty big blank. And it gets checked to you? Yeah, it checks to me. And so um, this is where I made the mistake. Well, I think I, I made a mistake here, or like just uh, maybe like my min click. I just don't know where hijack is. I just kind of hyper-focused on big blind when he called. I was like, all right, how do I get max value from someone with aces or like kings here. And it was like a dry board. And I, I didn't count for um, the backdoor spades coming in. So I just snap checked back. Wow. Yeah, I, I would not have checked back here. You yeah, don't yeah. have to go crazy large. I mean, it sounds to me like you're concerned about if you put too much pressure on this guy, you might fold out an overpair. Yeah, but he's folding quite a bit, so. Right, but again, the thing though is that it's so deceptive to play a six this way on this board because it is mostly call that I don't know if it overpairs are, are mostly folding here. So. I mean, you don't have to go crazy. You might even institute like a half pot size bet here. If you bet half pot, say the big blind called the other guy folded. I mean, the pot would be over a thousand, you know, at this point, and he'd have like 600 left, which kind of sets up a nice little uh, bet at the end. So I understand what you're saying. I think with the third guy in there, though, it kind of messes things a little bit up. I mean, you're sort of playing this in a really weird way where you raise the flop, making it look like you're weak, and then you check back the turn, possibly to get uh, you know, an overpair to bet at the end. The only problem, though, with that is that there is a guy in the middle 
So you're not going to necessarily see that reflective, or re, you know, um, that reflex bet from the big blind with an overpair for value because he still has to worry about the guy in the middle a little bit, you know? Right. So 550 to the river, okay. And the river is the seven of spades. So it brings in the backdoor flush. So six, six, deuce. Hero again has six, four of clubs. as an overcall, big blind raise, call, call, call. And big blind checks the flop. He gets over to the hijack who bets 55. Hero min clicks to 125. Big blind calls, call, turns the 10 of spades, putting backdoor spades out there. Checks through. Hero checks back. Now the river's the seven of spades. So six, six, deuce, 10, seven. Backdoor spades come in. Okay. So big blind leads out for 125 and hijack shoves for 550. Wow. Hmm. I ended up uh, tanking. Hold on. Before you tell, before you tell us what you do here, that's quite interesting. So the hijack is shoving here. Obviously the hands that you lose to, you obviously lose to a backdoor flush and the big blind might have an overpair here, but he probably doesn't have spades all that much and he's probably making a value bet like we talked about the hijack shoving here for 550 now of course you are under repped because you sort of main clicked and then check back turn i i wonder if this could be like six seven sevens if the guy had like deuce deuce and then he was going to try to pile in wow that's so 125 and he shoves for 550 so the pot is 675, like 1225, 550 for you to call. I think this is a fold, man. And the other thing too is, is that like once you call, if the big blind's any type of player, he should never, ever over call with an over pair. If you look at the action on the river, right? Yeah, I kind of want to fold here. And I lo it looks like the chat agrees as well. What did you end up doing? Yeah, so I ended up tank uh, folding. And then did we get a reveal? No, I didn't get a reveal. Um, big blind tanks, and then he folds two black aces face up. Really? Wow. The other guy didn't show. I th I mean, it's funny because there are a lot of guys in the comments like have gotten on us when we don't have a reveal, but it seems like everybody's in line here that this is a fold at the end. Um, you know, whether it, it's interesting, like your line, I, again, I, I talked about why I wouldn't take this line. I would still bet turn, but it still doesn't really matter in the fact that you know, if, if a guy like, again, the general population has not shown me that they're really capable of bluff raising all that much in this situation, multi-way from the middle in terms of like the hijack, you know, like having a hand that, that, that bluff raises here. So I, I think you made a pretty decent fold. Cause if, if hijack folds, then I think I could just shove for value, right? I mean, if hijack flats, I could just shove for value, right? If the hijack folds, I think you have to raise, you played it this way. Now if the hijack flats, I mean, I don't know if I would shove, but I think I would probably put in a raise. Yeah. And what if, what if on the flop, like it checks to me, my idea, uh, what I was going to do, I was going to bet 150 on the flop if it checked to me. What do you think about that sizing? Uh, I don't know if you have to go that large. I mean, you want some inferior hands to call. I would definitely start with a bet though. I probably would bet maybe like a little bit smaller. I, I would probably bet 60 or 75 to be honest. 60, 75? With you. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ian, I appreciate the call. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Bart. All right.